All right, so the uh, external components, including the, the protective housing, they, they hold that oil in and provide some other things we'll talk about in a minute, but the, the oil provides uh, heat dissipation. But it does some other things as well. So we got to, because it's so heavy with the oil, with the tube, with that big metal housing, we have to add something to hold it up. So that's your support system. When we talked a little bit about the support system in the last section, the most common support system is what we talked about in the last section. That's the two sets of rails that are mounted perpendicular to each other. So you got one set of rails going in one direction, one set of rails going in the opposite direction. And you've got that control tower that um, allows it to elevate and lower and also rotate. So you got a lot of locks on there. We talked about the locks. The locks are really solenoids that, that, that compress springs so that you can move around. But regardless, it has to have a counterbalance system or some sort of take-up reel because the x-ray tube itself and the, the protective housing, if you were to pick it up, it, it'd be about 80, 85 pounds. It's pretty heavy. We used to have some over in Pirtle, and you, you go to pick them up, and, and they're quite heavy. So it's got to have something to pick them up and, and help you to move them. Um, so in, inside that control tower, you've got that, that stuff. So you got the, the two sets of rails mounted perpendicular to each other. You've also got uh, support systems that go from, if you ever work in a, a doctor's office or if you've ever had x-rays in a doctor's office, anybody? Then chances are the, the doctor's office, the ceiling is too low to mount the, the overhead system on it. So what you'll see in a lot of cases is a rail on the floor and a rail on the ceiling, and then you've got this post that goes in between them, and the x-ray tube is hanging off the, or the, the there's an arm that comes off of that with the x-ray tube over that. So that's in the, in the case that you don't have the superstructure above the, uh, the, the false ceiling that's strong enough for the ceiling is not high enough to mount an x-ray uh, tube to the ceiling itself. That's what we had over in Pirtle. Um, our arrangement of our room up, upstairs, if you all noticed anything just a little bit different between our room and what you see in the hospital at all? Well, what have you noticed? Well, never mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> When you wheel a patient that. into an x-ray room, what's their orientation? When, if, when they're on a stretcher, how do you push them in most of the time? Foot first or head first? Feet first. Feet first, most yeah. of the time. Your rooms are usually set up uh, for convenience for the patient, right? So you wheel the patient into the x-ray room feet first because wheeling them in head first or wheeling them around a hospital head first in a lot of cases will disorient and make the patient nauseous. So, we try to push the patient in foot first, but whenever y'all are doing positioning, mock positioning on each other, where's your head? At the other end, right. So what happened whenever we, uh, they were building this building over here is uh, they put the superstructure at the wrong side of the x-ray room. So they put it on the right hand side instead of the left hand side. And we took a tour before they put the equipment in, and you know they were really under the gun to get this building finished. But but we walked in and we took a look, we took a look up into the ceiling, and there's a lot of metal, a lot of support that goes into holding that X-ray tube up. And we look up, and it's all on the wrong side of the the room. And I said, that's not right. That needs to be over there. And I kind of oh. Well, let me make some phone calls. So they, they made some phone calls and they said, okay, we, you're just gonna have to live with it. <laughs> We're gonna have to live with it. So that's a quarter million dollars in three months worth of work. Uh, the administration is not going to move it over. So that's how we wind up with the orientation exactly opposite of what it should have been is because uh, you know, there's some miscommunication and the superstructure went in backwards. So a lot of work, a lot of work to get all that stuff done. <clears throat> so if you're working in a hospital uh, that doesn't have unlimited space above that false ceiling, then you're stuck, right? So you have those floor to ceiling mounted systems. 
if you don't even have high enough ceiling, they do have just four mounted systems. And with those, they're really kind of dicey. That's actually what we had over in Turtle, is a floor mounted system. So you had this, this one rail on the floor, and it didn't climb a hill like that, but uh, off of that rail you had some rollers connected to a boom that went up, or a beam that went up, and a boom that came out this way, and the x-ray tube hung from that. So a very, very heavy counterbalance has to be inside this, this tower. Um, and we had a, a machine that um, that wasn't hooked up on, and you couldn't pull it down. Uh, I, I could hang from it, I couldn't pull it down. Very, very heavy weights inside of this thing to keep it from tipping over. And it did tip over at one point. Um, so, you know, these are not as stable as floor to ceiling mounted systems. But if the ceiling's not high enough to, to afford a, a double connection, then just floor mounted system. And I don't think floor mounted system is in the textbook. The C arm support, we've got a couple of different uses for C arm support. Most of the time it's going to be a fluoroscopy. Everybody been to surgery? Anybody not been to surgery? Okay, a few of you. Uh, have you had any kind of orientation of surgery in the equipment? Okay. So in surgery, we've got portable fluoroscopy units. And what they are is you've got a, uh, a media card that has, in most cases, two different TVs on it. But you've got this big portable unit, so I'm not gonna even try to, to make it look normal or right. But you've got this arm coming off of it, and that arm connects in turn to this great big thing that has an image intensifier on one end and an x-ray tube on the other. They call that a C arm. And you can see why, because it's shaped like a C, right? So uh, most of those are gonna be fluoroscopy units. And uh, you probably see at least two of these mounted on a ceiling support system back in special procedures or cardiac cath lab. But there are some other C arm uh, top systems and those are kind of the same configuration where you've got an image receptor and an x-ray tube, but they're usually more of a digital C, so they kind of go like this. So you've got an x-ray tube and then you've got a buggy instead of an image intensifier. It's not a fluoro unit. What it is is what they call a Tromax system. And a Tromax system, the benefit of a Tromax system is that it's all a self-contained system so that really you've got alignment between the x-ray tube and the buggy at all times. So if you've got a patient you're doing a cross table lateral uh, L-spine on, in a trauma situation, you turn it sideways, you scoot it up under the patient, you, you're lined up. And the reason it's squared off is because you can use 40 inches or you can use 72 inches. So you, you've got a, a range of um, SIDs that you can use. So we've got ceiling mounted systems. These are ceiling mounted systems. Um, you've got C-arm systems. These likewise are C-arm systems. And then you've got ceiling floor, and then you've got floor mounted systems, all designed just to, to allow you to move this big, heavy x-ray tube with the, uh, the housing outside of it. So ceiling mounted system is most flexible. But the housing itself, the x-ray tube is inside of the housing itself. And the housing is made of metal. And it is in part why that housing with the x-ray tube is so heavy. So what you've got is an x-ray tube inside of this big square-ish box. All right, so they call it protective housing because it protects in two different ways. It protects the x-ray tube. X-ray tubes are very expensive. You remember we talked about that earlier in the semester. It's just a really complicated, big, expensive light bulb. And X-ray tubes depend on what its use is and its expected life, expected use and expected life. It, it can be anywhere from, say, $5,000 up to $25,000. They're expensive. So it's not something that, that you want to break easily. Um, so. Part of what protective housing does is it protects the x-ray tube, but it also protects you as well. So when we make exposures, when we make x-rays, what we've got 
are electrons that travel across the tube really, really fast. They smack into this big chunk of metal. And the x-rays, really, it's really like you're dropping a bowling ball into, into a pond. So where's the water going to go? Everywhere, right. So what we have at the point of impact is what we call isotropic emissions. Isotropic emissions means that the x-rays at the point of impact are going to go off in all different directions with equal intensity. That's all it means. It's going to go off in every different direction with equal intensity. Well, this thing is made of metal. Right? The anode is made of metal. It's a big, heavy chunk of metal. I passed that around and it was heavy, right? So what do you know about metal and x-rays? They don't go through very well, right? X-rays don't go through metal very well. So it's, it's important to understand that isotropic emissions is at the interface where the electrons hit. That's right here. They go off in all different directions with equal intensity. So they're going to go back that way. They're going to go that way. They're going to go that way. They're going to try to go that way, but they've got to penetrate through that big chunk of metal. They're not going to penetrate through it very well. Some will, some won't. So um, this thing is going to absorb a lot of x-rays, right? But some might get through it. Some might get through a little, if, if it goes through a little portion of it, it'll, some of them will go through as well. So at the interface, we've got isotropic, emission, isotropic emissions. Uh, which means that if they're going off in that direction and let's say your patient is standing over here for a chest x-ray and you can't get out of the room for whatever reason, you're standing right here, guess what you're going to get? A lot of radiation exposure, right? So if we have just the x-ray tube itself and we don't have any kind of protective housing, can we collimate? Collimator housing is a portion of that, that tube housing, right? So if all we're interested in seeing is a patient's chest x-ray, what all are we going to expose just by shooting with the x-ray tube all out there by itself? Everything. The patient's going to get blasted from head to toe. So in putting the x-ray tube inside of a protective housing, and the housing's got the oil in it, and we talked about the oil, and the purpose for the oil was to... Cool it, cool it and um, slow down electron uh, We don't want to slow down the electron. It's just thermal protection. It's just to, to remove some of the heat from the x-ray tube. So it protects the x-ray tube in that way, but it also protects the patient by limiting the x-ray beams to a specific area, the x-ray uh, Photons come out of a specific area in the housing, and that, half, that area is what we call the window. All right, so with the isotropic emissions, the x rays are going all different directions, but we want to limit what comes out to just from the window itself. So it comes down and exposes exactly what we want it to expose. So does it block everything? Well, it should, but does it? And probably not. Uh, your aprons should block everything. What you'll learn in your second year when we run through some experiments is that it probably blocks a little less than what you would like for it to. Um, so some does get through that, but it needs, and if it does get through that, that's what we call leakage radiation. And it's funny, I used to, to, to do experiments with the uh, sophomore students whenever our primary technology was screens and films. And with screens and films, the, the amount of leakage radiation that would come out of even the collimator housing or the x-ray tube was undetectable on the films. The students would like take the, the x-ray tube and take the film and put it on the table, turn the x-ray tube and shoot it at the wall and make an exposure as if they were taking a chest x-ray and there would be nothing on the film. But our DR uh, image receptors are so sensitive that they'll pick, pick up some radiation exposure that the films would not. So uh, there is an acceptable amount of leakage radiation, but it's still leakage radiation. So 
even if you're shooting away from the patient, you're, or you're shooting towards the patient away from you, is it a good idea to be in the room with the, the dectra being energized? The answer is no, because you're gonna get exposed in two different ways. Leakage radiation may hit you, but also most of your dose is gonna come off of the patient. So even if the leakage radiation doesn't get you, the patient is gonna create scatter radiation, and it's not gonna bend around like that, but I didn't want to go back through that too. Uh, scatter radiation is what your most of your occupational dose is going to come from. Okay, so still get behind the control panel, uh, get behind the portable, get behind the radiologist, whatever, um, and get out of the way of the X-ray beam uh, so you don't get exposed. But the leakage radiation, the the housing has to be proficient enough to limit the leakage radiation and that amount of leakage should not exceed one milligray per hour at one meter. Okay, so how far is a meter? Three feet. It's basically a yard, so three feet. Yeah, so the amount of, of uh, leakage radiation shouldn't be one more, any more than one milligray of exposure at about three feet. Feet, which is one meter, okay? But it still can be there. So the protective housing, uh, because we've got isotropic x-ray creation, needs to limit what comes through. Preferably, nothing comes out of the, the housing except for through the window, but uh, that may be a little bit unrealistic, so uh, we can't have some leakage. It just can't be a whole lot. So it protects from over radiation. It protects from uh, you know, overheating the tube. The main thing that destroys your x-ray tube is heat, so it cools the tube back down. And then rough handling. So you know, if you're dragging your tube across the, the room, your finger ever slip off of the, the detent, that's what happens to the tube. Yeah, it's not going anywhere. It's gonna stop in a hurry, right? Um, so if this thing is full of fluid and it stops kind of quickly, uh, you ever been in the water and you try to move real fast? Yeah, what happens? <coughs> yeah, if, if you have the opportunity and you can clean this up, certainly you don't want to do this in a river or stream or a creek or whatever, but if, if, you, if, if you can have, you know, it's not all that hard to break a bottle, right? Try to do it underwater. It is tough, you know, because you just can't get a swing. So, with all the fluid that's in there, it uh, it also provides, you know, you've, you've got a very firm attachment, but it also provides, with the oil and everything else, some uh, protection from rough handling as well. So, thermal protection, uh, also electric shock from it protects from heat, rough handling, um, and leakage radiation is everything that, that the uh, protective housing protects from. So you got protection for you and protection for the tube against you, right? And also provides mechanical support. So any questions on the, the housing? No? Or the support system? So the x-ray tube itself, you heard all this, is a vacuum tube just like a light bulb. You drop a light bulb, and the reason it makes so much noise is because it, it's a vacuum, and whenever it pops, you know, you, you've got the rush of air inside of it. So it's a vacuum tube. The early x-ray tubes were not. They were a, a semi-evacuated x-ray tube. And what we find is that with any kind of pressurization, what we've got is air inside of the x-ray tube. Air is gas, you know, it could be any kind of gas. It could be partially pressurized even, but the gas interferes with the electron travel from cathode to anode. So what we've got is a, a, a diode, right? A diode just means two electrodes. So what we have here is an anode, and over here is a cathode. Both of them are odes, right? So they're diodes, so there's two of them. 
One, two, we've got a diode. It's a vacuum tube diode is all it is. So um, with the gas inside, we get interference with the electrons traveling from cathode to anode. And what that results in is erratic exposures. So he said a specific technique, and the technique that you set doesn't come out to the exposure you make. Okay? So for quality control purposes, our exposures have to be within 10% of the mass that we set. So we set a mass of, of 100 mass, it should be anywhere from uh, you know, 95 to 105, right? Uh, possibly a worst case scenario, 90 to 110. It should be within 10% of what you have set. So with the, the gas um, making that, that exposure erratic, we couldn't count on exactly what our exposure was gonna be. Um, and it may exceed that five or 10% uh, difference. So by evacuating all of the air, getting all the gas out uh, and creating a true vacuum, then we get a, a more consistent travel of electrons across the tube. The, the, uh, the travel of electrons is what directly controls your emission of x-rays. So the more electrons you send, the more x-rays you create. And there's a direct relationship. You send, you know, 2,000 um, electrons, then if you make an exposure based on those 2,000, if you send 4,000, then you're gonna exactly double your exposure. Mass controls your exposure. Mass controls the number of x-ray photons that you create. So we don't want that to be erratic. So vacuum tube removes that erratic nature, um, at least in, in that way. All right, so it's vacuum tube. If we lose that vacuum, and it happens sometimes, then what's gonna happen is that we're gonna introduce and probably some of that oil is going to get inside and it's going to get vaporized because it's going to get hot. You start cooking something on the stove top and you, your grease gets too hot, what happens to it? Yes. Start smoking, right? Well, same thing's going to happen there. It's going to evaporate it and it's, you've lost some of the, the uh, vacuum. You've replaced that with some gas and you're back to erratic exposures. So if you're ever working with a, a system and, and your x-ray tube suddenly, you know, your mass values just aren't right, consistently not right, that could be one of the things that you've got is a gassy tube. So you got two electrodes, you got a cathode, you got an anode, it's vacuum tube uh, diode. And if you lose that vacuum, you're in a gassy tube with a red exposure. Um, your tube itself can be either metal, so the, the tube is what they call an envelope. Envelope is just the, either glass or the metal enclosure for the components of the x-ray tube itself. The protective housing is not the envelope. The envelope is, is the, the, what holds the vacuum in, okay? So the envelope can be, most of the time it's gonna be glass, but it can be metal. All right, so the components inside, the main thing that we're creating inside of the x-ray tube is Heat, right. So uh, you got an incandescent light bulb that burns out, and you unscrew it, and you look at the bulb. What do you see? You got a light bulb. Mm -hmm. And you got the base there. The filament comes up, and the filament, what you call open filament, is kind of hanging. What do you see besides the open filament? You see kind of like a burned. Portion of the exactly, it looks burned right down here on the bottom, right? Or if it burns upside down, then it's probably going to be on the top, but it's burned. And what you've got there is over time that filament is, because of the heat that it creates, the, the light bulb creates, it'll burn that filament out. It'll vaporize that filament. And it's still metal, so that metal's going to want to go somewhere, right? So what it'll do is coat the inside of that light bulb. And the same thing will happen inside of our x-ray tube. So you heat that up a lot, you send those electrons, you create hot electrons, and we call that thermonic emissions. 
right? So they're hot electrons that we send across the tube, we create hot electrons, we send them across the tube, and we smack that thing with hot electrons. So over time, both of those things are gonna melt to some degree. It might not be appreciable in the anode, but it's probably gonna happen. It's definitely gonna happen in the filament. Your filament's eventually gonna burn out just like a light bulb. When that happens, just like in the light bulb, that stuff, that tungsten, as made of tungsten, is going to coat the inside of the x-ray tube. That's what we call tanning of the x-ray tube. Tanning of the x-ray tube is nothing more than what you see on your light bulb. It's taking some of that filament, you vaporize it, the vaporized filament coats the inside of the x-ray tube, and you've got what we call tanning. Now, big deal. What's the big issue with tanning of the x-ray tube? There's a couple of things. Uh, one is actually kind of a good thing in a way. Um, one is a really bad thing. So thinking back to chapter one, uh, what did we say x-ray creation, x-ray exposure, was it good? Was it, was it a, a good level of radiation exposure to the patient? It was higher. People died, right? People died because they got radiation burn. Edison rotted his, hand, his best friend's hands off, right? It wasn't good at all. So how, how is it that we made it more safe? Filtration. Filtration. Bingo. So what is filtration? Uh, getting out some of the higher KVP or the, the lower KVP. Lower KVP. So what we did was we put filtration or you know, Rollins uh, established filtration, and filtration what is what you call selective removal of low energy X-ray photons. Those photons are not going to contribute anything to the image, and all we want are X-ray photons that might make it through the patient and give us an image. Uh, if they don't, if there's zero percent chance that they're going to make it through the patient, then they don't matter to us at all. They don't matter. So, in diagnostic X-ray tubes x-ray tubes where um, you're going to expose the patient to x-ray values of 70 kbp or above, what we need is 2.5 millimeters of aluminum equivalent. Okay? So we got 2.5 millimeters of aluminum equivalent, and the equivalent is really kind of the, the kicker here. What that means in the equivalent is that we can use anything to get to this level as long as it equals the amount of low energy photons, 2.5 millimeters of aluminum will absorb. Does that kind of make sense? I kind of stumbled through that, but you, you kind of get it. Anything will work as long as we can measure it and say, okay, well, that thing absorbs as much x-rays as 2.5 millimeters of aluminum do. Okay? So, what's x-ray tube in? Uh, the protective housing. Protective housing. What's the protective housing full of? Uh, oil. oil. Right. So can we make some sort of uh, a, equivalent value between that protective housing and what it's made out of and also that oil that's inside and compare that to the 2.5 millimeters of aluminum? The tanning. Huh? The tanning. Well, no, I'm not there yet. I, I took a diversion. Okay. Went back. The, the answer is yes, right? So everything that, that the x-ray beam goes through before it gets to the patient contributes to 2.5 millimeters of aluminum. So you got a brand new x-ray tube. Brand new x-ray tube, never been used. What's the minimum filtration you gotta have? 2.5 millimeters of aluminum. So the oil provides some of that. The glass actually provides some of that. So the oil provides some of it. Glass provides some of it. And then it's going to go through the, the window, right? The window of the, the protective housing itself. Then it's going to go through the collimator housing. Collimator housing, you get a, a mirror. It's got to go through that. All of that helps to get you to 2.5 millimeters of aluminum, right? So your brand new x ray tube comes with all that. Now, you got an old x ray tube. That, that tube is now three, four years old, and the main thing that you've created in that three or four years is heat. With that heat, you vaporize this thing, you coat it on the inside of the glass, and you've got tanning. 
right? Now, so you went from glass. Is glass radiolucent? Yes. Yes. What is radiolucent? What does the word mean? It can pass through easily. It can pass through easily. But what do we say that, that, that there's nothing that is, what, what's, what do we, uh, let's see, transparent. What, what is transparency? You can see through it, right? So it's something that does not in any way obstruct your vision is, is transparent. Did we say that there was anything that was radio apparent? No. X-rays are going to be absorbed in pretty much anything. So um, the glass, it's radiolucent. It's very radiolucent. But is it radio apparent? No. No. So comparing metal and glass, which one is more radiolucent? Glass, right. Now, so we take that glass and we lay down a layer of metal on top of that glass. What does it become? Radio Less radio loosening, right. So, over time with the tanning, what happens to our filtration? We had 2.5 millimeters of aluminum equivalent with oil, with the glass, with pork, with the mirror. We had 2.5 millimeters of aluminum. What did the tanning do? Increase. It increased it, right. So that's one thing that it does, is it changes the, the level of uh, filtration. So now instead of 2.5 millimeters, we may have more like 2.7 millimeters. Maybe insignificant, it may be, depending on the age of the tube, it may be much more than that. So here's the rub though. Um, <clears throat> that also changes the imaging characteristics of your x-ray tube. Now, I've actually seen this in, in, uh, in action. Really. Um, so if we lo lose the low energy photons, we're just left with high energy photons. Mm -hmm. Okay? So what controls, what do you use to control contrast? What kind of technical factor do you use to control the contrast? Have y'all been through that in, in imaging? What do you use? KVP. KVP, right. So KVP is peak energy. All right. So when you make an x ray, Beam, and this is getting a little further along than, than where we need to be right now, but I, I want to stay here and explain this. When you make an x ray beam, at this point right here, you've got isotropic emissions, equal intensity in all directions. Most of your x ray photons are very low energy. So if we were to graph them out, and this was the number of x ray photons that we create, and this is the energy level measured in KVP then our, let's say we set a technique of 80 kvp, okay? At the point of impact, that's what we get, is a lot of low energy x-ray photons, very few high energy x-ray photons. But as it goes through the glass, and it goes through the oil, and it goes through the port, and it goes through the, the uh, mirror, and anything else that's required to bring it up to 2.5 millimeters of aluminum, our emission spectrum eventually looks more like that, okay? All right, you with me so far? You add more filtration, and what you get is an emission spectrum that looks more like this, okay? So your peak energy doesn't change, but your average energy increases, okay? And that's, that's the, the main thing I want you to pull away from this, is the average energy increases so that what you get is an x-ray beam that after you adjust for the loss of x-ray photons um, is more penetrating on average, okay? The average energy of most x-ray beams is about one third of peak energy. If you add more filtration, that increases it towards a high energy side. So if you're going towards a high energy side, what controls your contrast? KVP, what controls your penetration? KVP, right, so your photons are more likely to penetrate, the photons you have left are more likely to penetrate through the patient. The KVP controls your penetration and in controlling your penetration, it controls your contrast. So, if we have a higher average energy photon uh, left in our x-ray beam, what, is, what are the imaging characteristics of our x-ray beam? Is it gonna be high contrast or is it gonna be low contrast? Remembering that high contrast means it's very black and white. 
and we get that off of low KVP. If it's very gray and low contrast, then um, we get that off of high KVP. What we're left with here is a higher average X-ray beam quality or X-ray beam photon. So what's going to happen to our imaging characteristics of our X-ray beam is it's going to be inherently lower contrast. Okay, safer, right? Because we had a filtration. The purpose for filtration to begin with was safety. It's safer X-ray beam, but it also gives us lower contrast. So what do we want to see on X-ray X-ray beam? or actually image. Higher contrast. Higher contrast, right. So even though we've got a better quality x-ray beam, we've got a lower quality x-ray image. Okay? So it's a long way to go to say that that sounds good, that our filtration went up because it's a safer x-ray beam, but it screws up our image. And what are we trying to do? Get a good image, right? Now where I've seen this actually happen is in surgery. Uh, we used to have, if you want to go to surgery, um, at some point you're going to see a lithotripsy. And a lithotripsy is a study as a treatment where they break up kidney stones. So they put the patient in a, in a water bath and they make all this noise and that noise is focused on their kidneys and specifically on the kidney stone to destroy the stone. Right? And um, UT Health East Texas, what UT Maine, whatever they're calling it now. Um, it, uh, they used to have their own lithotripsy machine and it had these two x-ray tubes with two different image intensifiers. And whenever our first one to work in surgery, you could see stones really, really well. The stones are, uh, they're minimally radiopaque. Anybody seen a kidney stone? Yeah, you, you don't see them real well most of the time. They got a little bit of calcium, some salt. They, they just don't show up real well. You can see them, just not real well. So if over time we get an increase in beam energy, we get an increase in pil uh, penetration through those kidney stones and they don't show up as well. Worked in uh, surgery for two years. And by the end of those two years, you couldn't find kidney stones anymore. Those big exposures, we're having a fluoro through uh, water and through the patient in order to focus on these kidney stones. By the end of two years, we couldn't see them because tanning of the x-ray tube, I think, is what happened. They, they kept trying to tweak the machine uh, and the software to, to try to, to see the uh, kidney stones a little bit better. But the one thing that they never did was took a look at the x-ray tubes. I think we had such tanning going on that we had a very good quality x-ray beam that gave us a miserable image. We couldn't see it anymore. Okay? So tanning caused by thermionic emissions and creation of the heat. So it's both a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing for the patient because radiation dose to the patient goes down. It's a bad thing for the image. The worst thing though is that what we get with, with tanning is that without the tanning there, then we've just got glass. Glass a conductor or is it insulated? It's a good insulator. It's a very, very good insulator. But if, you know, thinking about our rules of thermodynamics, what do we have to have to, for electrons to go? We have to have the electrons, we have to have the electromotive force and the, the voltage, but we also have to have a conductor, right? So we build up all these electrons over here. And we've got this gap in between the cathode and the anode because we haven't pushed the, the exposure button yet then the, uh, the electrons stay on the cathode itself. They don't travel across, right? We match the exposure and they go straight across. And they're only going to go straight across the tube because we've got a, uh, you know, we've got a conductor here, we've got a conductor there, and we push them across the x-ray tube. And this is an insulator because it's just glass. they got nowhere else to go, right? But we lay down some metal on top of that. Where might it go? It could go straight down to the glass. Okay? So that's what we call arcing. Arcing is where the electrons don't travel from cathode to anode, they travel from cathode to the to the tube envelope 
because the tube envelope now has an electric potential, it's got electric pro properties, it's no longer an insulator, it's a conductor, and it may jump down to the glass. That's the most common cause for instant tube death. Let's say we've got a, an x-ray tube that's four, five, six years old, and all of a sudden it just quits. That's usually what happens. Right? So that only happens with a glass envelope. So with a metal envelope, with a metal envelope, what they may do is they may increase the distance here so that the the remembering that electricity is going to follow the path of least resistance. If it if, if the electricity is got a choice between going from uh, the cathode to the anode and the distance is only about that far, but the distance between the cathode and the x-ray tube, the, the envelope itself, is three times as far. If it follows the path of least resistance, which path is least resistant? Provided we've still got a vacuum. It's just straight across, right. So if they can overcome the likelihood that this is gonna happen in the engineering of the x-ray tube, is it really going to matter if we put a, a very thin layer of metal on top of that other metal? No. No. It's really not. So the benefit to a metal um, envelope is that you don't have the hardening problems. Do you still have the problems with tanning? Yeah. Absolutely. Do you still have the issues eventually with uh, decrease in the tube output and increase in average energy and messing up your imaging characteristics? Yes. The only thing that you've overcome is the, the likelihood of arcing. Metal tubes don't arc. Everything else still applies. Okay? Okay. That's not right. What time? 10:35. What? 10:35. Wow. Yeah, that's not right. <laughs> All right. So inside the X-ray tube, you got a cathode and anode. The cathode is the last thing we're going to talk about. So it's a diode. It's a vacuum tube diode. It means it's got two electrodes. We've got a positive end, we've got a negative end. So on the negative end, what we've got is a filament where we supply electrons. The only reason for its existence is to supply electrons. So when we push the prep button, you know, we get the rotation of the anode, uh, which is a positive end, but we're not really doing anything with the x-ray tube itself except for spinning the anode and then creating a space charge. So we've got a space charge. Of hot ions, we've got thermionic emissions. All right, so you press the prep button, spin the anode, and then you energize an entire lower uh, circuit that was on the diagram on the last test. So that circuit is energized, and we've got current through the anode itself, but we don't have tube current. Tube current doesn't occur until the electrons make that jump across the tube. At that point, we've actually got tube current. But at this point, the only thing that we've got is uh, filament current. And we already said the filament current is always present to keep the tube warm, right? Remember talking about that? It's always present at a low amperage just to keep the, the x-ray tube warm. So what we've got over here is 15 to 25 volts with some sort of amp to keep it warm. And whenever we pre press the prep button, that doesn't change. The only thing that changes is the number of electrons so that we actually get to thermionic emissions. All right. <clears throat> so now we've got a lot of electrons. We've got a tremendous number of electrons congregated just on the filament itself. It's not like you push them onto the filament and they just stay there. It's a complete circuit, so you feed them in one, one direction and they go out the other direction. We have alternating current at this point. We don't have to have direct current through the filament. It can be alternating current. It doesn't really matter. That's not tube current. So it can be alternating current. So uh, once we press the prep button, 
we heat the filament up. Again, the, the entire lower circuit only exists to heat that thing up so that we get a spray, space charge of thermionic emissions. So we press the fret button, it heats up. Still no tube current. Um, now, what were our laws of, uh, of electrostatics? Like charges do what? Repel. Right. Like charges repel. So we've got like charges repel. We've got uh, the more charges that we have, the more charge we have. Right? So the, the electrostatic charge is directly proportional to the, the uh, number of electrostatic charges we have. So the reason that that happens is because we've got all these electrons fighting against each other. So if we try to put them all on here, what, what, are, what are they going to try to do? Push themselves apart. So our space charge can actually get much larger than our filament size itself. Okay? So what we use to control sharpness of recorded details a number of different things. We want OID is to be as low as possible. We want SID to be at a you know specific rate, uh, depending on the exam. But what we use in the equipment is filament. So in our cathode, we're going to have two filaments. The purpose for the two filaments are big heat load for the big one, because these are all hot ions. And then for the little one, we've got sharpness or reported detail. We want to increase sharpness or reported detail, we use a little filament. Now let's say on that little filament, we, we put so many electrons on there that the cloud is this big. Once we send those electrons across the tube, because they're all negative charges, what are they going to have a tendency to want to do? Yeah. So you've got a little bit of control by your filament itself and, and how far out they can go. But once you push those across the x-ray tube, they're going to have a tendency to spread out. So if what we use is the filament size to control sharpness or reported detail, what's that going to do? Just push them across the x-ray tube without having all these things on the, the filament itself. What, what are they going to do? They're going to spread out and your sharpness or reported detail goes, right? So what we're going to have, also on the cathode end of the x-ray tube, is if you remember that the filament, or the filaments, were embedded in, inside of the anode end of the x-ray tube. And this thing surrounds the filaments, and that's what we call the focusing cup. The focusing cup has a small charge on it as well, also 15, 25. KVP, or volts rather. So while these things are trying to push each other apart, this is trying to push them back together. So it combines that space charge so that it doesn't spread out too much. If it spreads out too much, then what we have is what we call blooming of the space charge. So blooming of the space charge just means we've got so many electrons that it, it exceeds the capacity of the filament and the focusing cup to keep them combined. They're combined. So when we send them across the x-ray tube, they spread out, and that lowers our sharpness for reported detail. Okay, I think I'm out of time, but I really didn't get all the way through uh, the cathode end of the tube. Yeah? So blooming is what? The spreading out of electrons? The spreading of electrons and the the loss of sharpness of reported detail because of the spreading of the electrons. Okay. So we'll have to pick up there on Friday. So we're probably going to have, I think we're scheduled for a test on Wednesday. We'll probably have to put that, push that back on Friday. We'll see what happens this Friday. Okay. When you get tanning in a glass tube, and it changes the, the uh, potential of cross x-ray tube, and the electrons just start going from the cathode to anode, go from the cathode to the glass.